going to be a good lesson today. Hello everyone, I'm Chris O'Hara, back for another guitar tutorial, and today uh, I've been meaning to get to this one for a long time, but I'm excited about it because I love talking about music theory. And this is going to be a good tutorial for those of you who've never studied music theory, and or those of you who kind of see some gaps in their understanding. And I'm going to start from real basic and kind of build up, and I'm going to re relate it to the guitar as much as I possibly can because this is for guitar players out there and so we want to be able to see how this stuff applies to the instrument okay and I think there's a lot of benefits to music theory not only will it help you kind of understand how everything is kind of put together but it'll help you in areas like uh, songwriting, improvisation, and as well as like ear training. It's going to give you very concrete concepts that you can use to be able to help your ear understand the sounds that, that you're hearing. Okay, so um, you guys know the drill, all the information is below, so check that out. If you like what you see, share it, subscribe, you know the drill on that too. So at any rate, let's get started in this theory tutorial. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a kind of a high level view of how we form keys. Alright, so have a look up here. So within these two circles, the, the one that has 12 dots in there, those are all the notes that we have in music. And some of you may think, well I got all these frets and strings and everything, there's got to be more than 12. Well there's octave doublings of those 12 notes but technically there's really only 12 distinct notes in music and what an octave basically is it's a doubling of the frequency so for instance let's just assume that this is not correct but let's just assume that this A here is vibrating at 400 cycles a second an exact doubling of that is would be 800 cycles a second exact doubling of that would be 16 and it goes kind of up from there so anytime we double the frequency, that would be like the octave of that. That's where we have all the notes on the guitar. Pretty basic, some of you probably already understand that concept, but when we get into forming chords, you're gonna see why we like to double some of these notes within that chord. So when we take, when we, when we look at there are 12 notes, those are all our options. What we're gonna do is we're gonna distill that down into seven notes. And the seven notes will create a major scale. It'll create other scales as well. There's different patterns and different ways we extract seven notes. Some keys have only fives. Um, they, they have different numbers. But what we're going to be mostly working with is the major scale today. And that scale has seven notes in it. All right. So again, we start with 12. We extract. Oops. We extract get my brush here, 7 out of that 12, and we kind of move them over into the smaller pile. And we can do a lot with this. We can play them, we can play those 7 notes in order. That's that Do, Re, Mi, Va, Sol, Do, Do. Here's the octave above that one. Or we can form or group them together with 3 notes at a time to form chords. And what that would look like is like this. So if I take, let's say, these three notes right here, that would form a chord. I could also take, let's say, these three notes here. You can see there's crossover. So a lot of chords contain a similar note or sometimes two notes that are similar. For instance, if I select these right here, that would, um, that would form a chord, but you can see there's two common notes between those particular chords. So there's a lot of crossover and there's a lot of options that we can do to create chords with it. So in, the, in that scale, we have seven different notes. We can also construct seven different chords out of that. We're going to get into more detail in just a second. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like on a staff. Now, even if you don't, um, actually, let me back up for one second. The remainder, the remaining notes within that pile of 12, okay, are going to be, well, let's say if we extract the 7 and it's going to be our key of C, and that's what we're going to look at here. Key of C doesn't have any sharps or flats in it. 
So what's left over in that remaining four notes in that pile of 12 um, would be all the sharps or flats. And what's kind of tricky about this concept, this is important to know, which is there's a lot of times there's the same note can have two different ways of writing it. So for instance, you can see here, this is on our fifth string, and the, the note in between C and D, as it's displaying here, is C sharp. But it also could be a D flat. It's just the way this program is kind of labeling it, and it may change depending on how you write these things in. Doesn't matter, just keep that in mind. So anytime you see a sharp, it has a, an equivalent name to it based on the flat. So D sharp could also be E flat, okay? And that, we're gonna get into key signatures in a second that's gonna kinda help solidify some of these concepts. All right, so let me get rid of this. And what I wanna bring up is my staff and also this key of C here. And I'm gonna get rid of our chords first. So what we have here is a C scale. Now, the musical alphabet goes like this. It goes A, B, C, D, F, G. And what's kind of interesting is the C scale has no sharps or flats. And I sometimes get this question, which is why, why does C have no sharps or flats versus A? You would think A would have no sharps or flats in it. And I think that's a great question, and it's a question Honestly, I don't know the answer to, but what I want to kind of get your head around is that just remember that C is kind of our starting scale in a way. And what I mean by starting scale, it's, it's, it's the scale that is the easiest to see and the easiest to understand. If you look at a piano, the key of C is all the white notes. It's other keys too, but again, we're just looking at major scale and the chords within the major scale for this lesson. So. All white notes on piano, key of C. Start with that. All right, so when we extract those seven notes out of that pile of 12, what we're doing, we're, we're being very strategic of, of the order, not so, not so much the order, but the interval that those notes get extracted to form a major scale. And so the piano is literally laid out, in a sense, for the key of C. And so, Let's take a look at some of these, what's going on here. So if we look at this key of C, the distance between the two first two notes is a whole step. And I notate that with a W. And let me show you on this chart here. So that's our first note of that scale, whole step apart, which is one, two frets apart. The next note is two frets apart. The next note is one fret apart, which is a half step. Another whole step, we're gonna keep going up. Another whole step, another whole step, and then a half step. So this is literally looking at the scale just on one string. We can play the same scale across the guitar. There's many different ways we can we can play this. There's way more than that, but that's what makes the guitar really difficult to learn is that there's many ways to play exactly the same thing. Where other instruments don't necessarily have that problem. So, let's take a look at another. So this actually let me go over here. I'm going to write this in so we have a whole step here between those two, a half step between the third note and the fourth note, whole step, whole step, a whole step, and then a half step. Now if we use that same spacing for, let's say, starting on a different note, we're going to get a different scale, a lot of simil simil similarities in the sense of the notes but there can be a slight alteration to fit that pattern. Here's what I mean. So if we go, let's say we start on G and we're gonna form this key starting on G. And the key is usually identified by that starting note. So if I go up and mimic the spacing of that C, look at what I get here. 
almost identical the same notes, but as you can see here, there's a difference. Now we have a, an F sharp versus in C there was an F here. And it's because of that spacing. So that's what makes the key of G unique, is it has one sharp to it, and it is an F sharp. So we've modified, we've gone from an F, and we've raised it up to match that spacing, um, and we it creates an F sharp. So the, what they call the key signature would be F sharp, and that tells me that the key of um, G, that we're playing the key of G. So if we're looking at our, our staff, here, what they would do is they would write a F sharp in the very beginning, and that would tell you to sharp all the Fs in the music, keeping that G, key of G, consistent throughout. And they may change keys and they may alter that, but that's kind of the, the, the meat of how this works. Some keys have two sharps, F sharp and maybe a C sharp. Or maybe they have a flat. We're going to get into the key of F in a bit, and that key of F has one flat to it. So you'll see why in a sec. All right, so, there, so we have our scale, okay? Now each one of these notes of the scale can also, we also refer to this as scale degrees. So the C is the first scale degree, E is the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then seventh. And so it's different than um, what we're going to get into later, which is chord degrees. But the scale degrees is just the scale. So this is first, second, third, fourth. So anytime someone says play the fifth, I just count up to the fifth and play back down. But it's also relative to what the starting note is, meaning D could also be one and the F is the third away from it. It's actually flat third, but I'll get into that later. Um, so it's a little bit relative, but we're mostly going to be starting from the beginning of this scale, in this case C. So here, this numbering system is going to be used for scale degree versus Roman numerals, which you're going to see in a bit, are used for chord degrees. So there's a difference between scale degrees and chord degrees, okay? All right, and this is going to hold true for, let's say, let me grab key of F. So here's what the key of F looks like. Oops. I'm going to get rid of the chord extensions here. So it's the same, literally the same pattern everything, except we're dealing with different notes. So if we get over here, let me erase this. I keep my key of C here. Start on F. This is on my sixth string. It's the same pattern, it's offset because of where F starts, but there's a B flat here. And again, it's because normally our B is there, we have to make this correction, we have to bring that B over, oops, yes, because it's the, again, the fourth note. Look at this, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, half step. Again, this is offset here, so back to F, all right? So same spacing that we have here except we have to make that one correction right here. All right, so let's go back to C for a second, and we're gonna take a look at how now we can build chords using this, this concept, okay? So when we build chords within the key, we have to still stay true to that pile of seven notes. We can't use anything outside of that, or it's gonna sound like um, we're, we're basically playing outside the key. And most music is generally true to the key. Now, there's always exceptions to this to these rules, but um, it's it's pretty common practice to stay within these key structures. So when we build chords, what we do, there is a pattern to that construction. So I've added the remaining notes to the chords, as you can see in the blue here. So if we pick apart the very first chord, which would be C, okay each scale degree we can form a chord off of, as you can see here. And the red basically represents the root of each one of these chords. So let's dissect a little bit of what's happening here. So between C and the next note, and this is E, even if you can't read staff, I think you'll, I think it'll make sense as we work through this, it's okay. Um, uh, it's okay not to, not to be completely fluent with a staff. So if we look at the first two notes between C and E here, there's a distance between those. Interval, distance or interval, it's 
same same idea. So we can see if I get rid of break it down to just those. I like to look at everything on one string because it's 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 the same way a piano player kind of looks at it. We can um, and then we're going to work a little bit across later, but check this out. One, two, three, four. So that spacing between C and E is what they refer to as a major third interval. Now if we go back to this, the next note has a different kind of spacing on it, which is G right here. You can see it's one, two, three. So the they are different. There's a difference between the first two and the second two. And that distance, there's there's variations is what gives it its sound. In this case, it's a major chord sound. And so let me write this in. So I usually use a big M for major third, that's a major third interval, and a small M for minor third interval. And chords are built off thirds. They either use yeah, major or minor third. It doesn't matter. As long as you're using thirds, you will construct a chord. Now there are obviously different types of chords, and we're going to get into that with this next chord, which is we have some kind of D chord here. So let's kind of analyze what's happening from that starting note D here. This is the chord right here. And you can see that it has, it's similar, but different in the sense that it's swapped as far as the spacing. So this first spacing here is three frets, or our minor third interval and F to A is 4 frets, which is our major third interval. So it's literally just the opposite of that first chord. And this is the formula for a minor chord. So every minor chord goes up a minor third and then up a major, whoops, a major third. Let me make that a major third. There we go. I apologize for my handwriting. It's not the best. I try though. Now, we can go through and do the math on the rest of these chords here. But um, I'm going to save you some time. <laughs> I'm going to write them in. So the next chord starting in E is going to equal an E minor chord. So it's going to have the same spacing as D minor. F is the same spacing that you would see on a C major chord. And that's going to be F major, G major, A minor. Then we get to this one. This is the one kind of outlier of the bunch, which is diminished, okay? So let's take a look at our thing and why that is. So B looks like this. Oops. You can see that the spacings are the same between B and D and D and F, it's three. And diminished chords they're what they call symmetrical, meaning they're built off the same spacing between um, each of the notes. So if I write some of these formulas down here, we get this. Let me go back with the major equals whatever root you start on, then you go up a major third, and then you go up a minor third, and you will form a major chord. So here's that C, C, E, G. Now if we do the minor chord, As you see, you can see, it's just the opposite. So I'll do that same chord, I'll do a minor chord on the C. And what's interesting is the, the difference on that C here is that center guy. We've gone, technically this should be an E flat, it's just the software won't let, it just doesn't label it that way. So here's our major chord. If I move that guy over, it gets minor. And that's literally the only difference. The outer notes stay exactly the same. So here's major. Let's see if you can see this. If I move that middle one, which is this E right here down, I get the minor. But I'm still playing the outer ones the same. Not trying to flip you off there. Ooh. So the outer notes, G, sorry, C and G, equal a power chord. Looks like this on the staff here. So if I just use that G and I move it over here, okay, so that becomes our power chord. What's great with the power chord is that it's not major or minor. 
and so we can use them in either one of those positions. So as you, if you remember, the second chord in that key was D minor. Well, I could just use that power chord shape to play the D, instead of the D minor, I could just use those two. Now it doesn't give us all the information. The power chord is getting rid of that I, one note that identifies the chord quality to it, meaning major or minor. And, uh, and it's not like, it's not like when people use it, it's not like they're trying to cheat, like they don't know what the chord is. It has a certain sound, that power chord. It's just kind of, kind of the foundations of a lot of rock music. Now, a lot of times people will play the power chord like this. They, they play the octave of the C above that, which is a three finger power chord. And, that, and so it's not three notes, it's still just those two notes, except we have the octave C above that, all right? So let's go uh, check out that diminished chord again. Um, actually, I'm gonna do it on a C here. So a diminished chord, just so you can see the comparison, it's parallel comparison. So what we've done to get to form this diminished chord is we've had to move these intervals closer together to make them the same. So this is a minor third and this is a minor third. And so in this key here of C, that's where we get, notice there's no sharps or flats and we get that pattern there. It sounds like this. It's hard to play it. It has a very evil sound to that. So sometimes I like to compare it with the C because it's, um, we can see it's really easy to spot where the changes are, meaning where the sharps and or flats are. All right, all right. So let me write that. We have our diminished chord. All right, just D I M for diminish. Again, we have our root. It's built off the same intervals. Now there's another one. We're dealing in in today's lesson. We're mostly dealing with just what we call triads, which are three note chords. They can get more complex, meaning we can play four note chords, five note chords, that kind of thing. But right now we're just dealing with triads. So there's really only four different combination of triads that you can create using these thirds. And so we have three of them. The final one, which is augmented, which would be just the opposite of a diminished, which is built off major third intervals. Now the augmented chord is not found in major scale harmony. The reason why is because of the spacing. You won't. You can do all the math in the world to try to figure it out, but you will not find anywhere where this spacing is found within the scale pattern. So it has a very unique sound. It sounds like this. Kind of has a mystery kind of element to it. So that's our augmented chord there. All right. So now we're gonna take a look at chord degrees. We're gonna take this a little bit further. Kind of zoom in a little bit here. Remember we had the scale degrees, but now we have the chord degrees and they are, they are labeled using this, um, let's see, yeah, there we go. They are labeled using Roman numerals. Now. The, uh, the kind of the classical way of writing these Roman numerals is they use smaller case ones for minor. Um, sometimes I don't think they even write a little M next to it, um, but I kind of add it just to kind of help drive that in that those are the minor positions. Um, the jazz, kind of the jazz, when I went to Berkeley, they kind of taught you this way to write it. Like, so if it's a minor chord, you would still use an uppercase Roman numeral and just write an M next to it. If it's a seventh, they would go like that. So everything was capitalized. So it's just, it's not a big deal. It's just get used to, um, uh, just get used to seeing it both ways, I guess. So I wrote them as in small Roman numerals for this, for today's lesson. All right, so just like scale degrees, we have chord degrees. And What's kind of real, what's really useful with these Roman numerals is that it's universal over uh, all, all the keys, meaning the major scale and the key and the chords within this major scale. 
they're use they can be um, they're the same and you're gonna see in a second why that is so for instance if I play this first chord C and then I play the next chord F here and then I play G and then I go let's say I go back and play that F again you get this progression now you probably recognize that and that's a very what part of what makes you recognize that song is that chord progression and you may not if if you didn't see my hands you may not know what key it's in but you still recognize it and this is kind of what we're getting to is like you're hearing that movement between a one chord a four chord and a five chord back to that four chord and i can play that 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 pattern that that progression in any key as long as i keep everything in its same ratio so for instance if i switch over to my key of f here here is the chords in key of f and i'll play the same song let me add those play the same song using um, this, I should say this, yeah, same song, same chord progression, but now we're playing an F, sounds like this. Sounds like the same except just lower. And this, what's great with this is if you're working with a singer or if you're singing yourself and the song that you like is, it's, it was originally sung in a, in a key that's either too high or too low, you can use this sort of theory to transpose the chords into a key that works for you. It goes even further than that, which is what's cool is like, when you start to listen to music, you'll start to identify these chords in Roman numeral form. So for instance, if I'm just listening to a song on the radio, a lot of times what goes through my mind is, oh, that sounds like a one chord going to five chord going to four chord. I don't know what key it's in. I can kind of guess or get close, but I hear those relationships uh, of the chords. Now, an extra uh, thought on this, which is you need multiple chords or you need to hear more than one chord to really understand what the key center is. And what I mean, what I, what I kind of mean by that is, if we take a look at this key of F here, and I were to play a C chord, well, what does that mean by itself? It doesn't mean anything unless I have context. So I need to hear other chords to give that C its identity, which in this case is the five chord. A five chord has a very specific weight in the progression, meaning it doesn't want to, it's not, you don't want to sit on that chord. It wants to resolve somewhere. But it only wants to resolve, like I said, if I have other prior information. My ear needs to hear what context it is. So let me give you an example. I think it'll make sense. So if I, again, if I just play the C chord by itself, that could be anything. It could be the one chord, it could be the four chord, it could be the five chord. But in context, so the five chord generally likes to go to one. And I know, I know in the example I gave you, it went from five to four, which it likes to go there, but it really likes to go to one. Our ear hears that. So when I'm listening to music and I hear a major chord and then it kind of resolves like to a stable position or point, that I can kind of identify that as the five going to the one. Um, it takes a little bit of practice. There's no question about that, but that's how my ear hears things. And over time, you'll get better at hearing what a two chord sounds like, uh, two minor chord, three minor chord, six minor, and so forth. Um, at first, it does take a little bit of practice. So here's a cool exercise, which is take one of these keys, like key of F or key of C, and write your own chord progression. So for instance, we'll do a quick one right now. Key of, let me go back to the key of C, because it may be a little bit more familiar to most people. And I'm just gonna pick a couple of chords out of here. I'm gonna start on the C chord here. I'll start on this one. Remember that the second position, third position, 
and the sixth ones are minor, and the seventh one is, is diminished. Oops, looks like a six. Let me do that correctly, make sure. All right, so I'm gonna start on the C chord. And if you know what the landscape is, meaning what the other chords are that you have available to you, you can literally, it's multiple choice at this point. Very cool. So I'm gonna go start on C. Then I'll just go to, let's say, an D minor. And let's say I'll go to an F. And I'll go to G. Back to C. So it's C, D minor, F, played it a slightly different way. G, back to C. starting to sound like a song and it's kind of like I said it's kind of multiple choice what's gonna sound good to yours is gonna be different than what sounds good to my ears um, or you know you have to kind of use your own creativity of what works so what I recommend you do is figure out a chord progression and record it over and over for maybe I don't know five minutes or so and if you know the scale pattern start to use the scale to improvise over them. You'll start to create simple melodies. And, or you can just improvise whatever. That's because that scale is going to fit whatever chord progression you come up with because those chords are created based off that scale. So it really simplifies, especially when we get into improv improvising, it really simplifies what we're going to use to to create that solo so it's a great exercise and then come up with another pattern progression and do the same thing now what you'll find is that you you'll tell yourself well I'm playing the right scale but it doesn't always sound right and here's what's kind of happening in that context which is if you play let's say that C chord and you play the next note of the scale so you got this chord happening, and you play that D right here, okay? And what, what's going to happen is this D note, because it's not part of that chord, it's going to create some tension. It's like right in the middle here. And our ear wants to hear that tension resolve either up or down. The D generally likes to go down. Most things like to go back to the root in this case, but in most cases. But uh, so, so that's that note is going to again have that sort of dissonance in a way even though it's in the key it's going to have a little bit of dissonance until we resolve it now it's okay to have that every all music has tension and resolution and we want that it helps the tension helps push the music forward and so but just so you know that's kind of what's happening what's challenging is that if you're moving through if the rhythm part is moving through these chords it's it's kind of like hitting a moving target. But I wouldn't worry too much. Just play the scale and use your ears to kind of navigate through that progression. And over time, what will happen is you'll start to study arpeggios, which is basically the chord played uh, one note at a time. So here's a C chord. That's the C, E, G. I can continue that up another octave. So when I practice, a, when I'm working on a song, what I like to do sometimes is I'll, I'll look at the progression and I'll, I'll work on arpeggios of every chord within that song. And that maps out kind of the safe notes. So when that C chord hits, I know where the safe notes are. I know where the, sca the scales, the whole scale is, so I can now have this freedom of if I want to add tension to it, and I know how to resolve it because I know where the notes I need to resolve to, in this case, C, E, G. And the same would go with all these chords. So if I'm on a D minor chord and I play an E, that's going to be a tension in that. And it's going to want to resolve either down or up to one of the chord tones. So here's, a, here's, a, 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 here's another example. I think this may help a little bit. I'm on a C chord, standard C. So here's a real common chord variation, which is to add our pinky right here which is on a D. Let me, let me actually map this out. So I'm playing, as you know, 
standard C chord. Now, a real common thing to do is to change, to raise this C up to this D here, and that's what I'm doing by adding my pinky here. But, so you can see that that D is the second scale degree, um, and it's gonna be our tension note. That D is gonna wanna resolve down to that C. Now, it doesn't always do that, and that just creates a certain kind of sound, but if I play it for you, See how that sound of that D wanting to go down to that C? Here's another real common one, is if I play that F there, that F is going to want to resolve down to the, um, the E. Here it is, same thing, this is an F up here. You hear that a lot. What that looks like is, I'll kind of map it out here. Whoops. So I play that. So that F wants to resolve down to that one. And this, a lot of times when you learn shapes in the chords, what's nice is to know what quality they are and knowing where the root is because I can move this shape because this shape right here is a C major chord, and since it's a major chord shape, I can play that same shape in different places and still get the, the major chord sound. So as you can see here, this is an F chord. F, A, C is the order of the chord, um, from low to high that is. And so all the notes of that F chord are outlined in here. The F is played twice, just like the C down here. So that shape is a major chord shape. If I know where the 145 of the key is, I can literally use the same shape just to move it to the appropriate place along. So I'm, what I'm gauging is I'm gauging the lowest, the root of the, each one of these chords. I don't have to re I don't have to really necessarily know what the notes are if I know the shape. As long as those the shape is correct, it's always going to come out as a major chord. Or let's say it's a minor chord. Here's what a minor chord shape looks like. I make those alterations. Now I have a C minor down here to a C minor up here. Sorry, F minor. It's a C minor to F minor to G minor. So that's why these that's why memorizing a lot of your bar chord shapes are going to be, I think, are really important. And also knowing what the, what the notes are along the fifth string here and also along here. All the way up and down. I'm not going to write them all in there, but if you know those, because these can be the root of each one of the chords that you can play. So again, if you have a C, right? and you need to play an F, I just find that pattern, I go all the way up to that F, and my fingers are already in that shape, and it's gonna equal that, all right? So take a look at this. So he, some of these bar chords you may recognize, like this. Let me get rid of these open strings here. Just to, so here's our G bar chord right here. G major bar chord. All right? If I play that same pattern on C, ooh, come on. There we go. Same pattern. And it's gonna give you those three notes of that chord. You can see in that bar chord that there's a lot of doubling going on. We have an octave G right here and another G up top here. We have two Ds and what. So you can strip them down to just the three notes, which is an option. Um, but uh, basically why we would kind of double some of these notes to make it sound bigger and thicker. Think of it kind of like a choir. When you see, let's say, 20, 30 people singing in a choir, it just sounds huge. And it's not because everybody's singing different notes. It's usually they're either singing unison, which is the same octave of, let's say, there several people are singing this G. Then you'll have other people singing an octave above. You'll have other people singing the third of the chord, singing the D, and so forth. So we have kind of like a mini choir. It's one way to think of it several voices to play on the guitar. 
So here's what's really difficult, I think, about guitar, is if I go, if I take this a step further and look at just the C chord, here are the three notes of the C chord laid out on one string. Now, as you can already tell, there's many ways to play those three notes. I can play them like that. I can move this C over to here. I can do an octave higher and play the three notes here. I can move that C up here. As long as we're hearing those three notes, it's always going to be a C. All right. I can play it right here. I can play it here. And I can, there's so many things you can do. I can move this E down an octave. Let me get rid of these here. You can move these around as much as you want. And so, so it's, it feels like there's endless possibilities with just playing a single chord. And that's what makes it, again, really difficult on guitar is that we generally study all these different positions. Now, there's some common ones that we go to that work all the time. They're just great shapes to know. And a lot of those are in the form of those bar chords, those open chords, and, and everything. Now, I will take this a step further, which is it's also nice to know not only the shapes, but what scale degree each one of these notes of the chord, um, how it fits in. Let me give you an example. It's kind of a little bit hard to describe. But if we take a look at this C chord again, I know <clears throat> that that C is the first scale degree. The G is the fifth scale degree. Back to the C, which is the first scale degree. <clears throat> the E is the third scale degree. So, and that's going to be universal. So even if I play on the F chord, I know that this is the first scale degree on F. This is the fifth scale degree away from F. This is back to one again, and this is the third scale degree away from F. We always have to kind of gauge it based on what the root is. And you may be a little bit confused because you're like, well, isn't F the fourth scale degree in the key of C? One, two, three, four. And that's right, but when we're dealing with a chord, it's almost like it's its own thing. We have to analyze what, we, what we're experiencing in that split second of that chord. So our ear, what it's doing is it's hearing that lowest pitch. In this case, F I'm playing. And it's analyzing what the relationship these other notes are to that F. So what I tell myself when I hear it is I, create, I think of that as one, the first or the scale degree one, and this is the five, and this is that. It's a sliding scale is another way to kind of think about it. It helps with, uh, with ear training. So I like to be able to see what these relationships are based on where the root is. Okay. Now, when we mix these chords up like this, let's say I have something like this. Actually, let me go in order. So it looks like this, C, E, G. A little out of tune. So if I take this first chord here, C, and I take this C and I move it up an octave, that's an inversion. And I can do it again. I can move this E up here. And if we look at our staff real quick, what's happening is we're basically moving this E, plopping it up here, so we get rid of it, and then that's our chord, and then we can move this one up again and get rid of this one down here. And so that's basically how inversions work. And I'm not going to get in too much into that, but I think you kind of get the gist of it. As long as, but as long as we're hearing again, those three notes, our ear is going to do the math on that. Okay. Um, let's see what else do we got here. I mentioned the kind of the the homework assignment. I would definitely play around with different chord progressions. Another thing that you want to do, and I'll kind of end on this, which is when you're learning songs, try to learn the chords in in this Roman numeral relationship because it's going to feed how you're you're interpreting how you're hearing it you want to get used to hearing oh that's a four or five one whatever the case may be and over time you'll these same progressions come up over and over again to the point where you're like you can spot 
a 1-4-5 progression right away. Again, you may not know what key that is in, but that'll be easy. Once you figure out what key is in, everything will, you'll know what everything else is. One little trick that I do is I listen for the bass note, because the bass player is generally going to be playing the root of the chord. So if the bass player is playing, let's say, the root F, and I know what key it's in, I know it's going to be an F chord. Um, could be an inversion, but generally they're going to be playing the root of the chord. Um, one nice thing is, again, it just you know, knowing the chords within the key is going to reduce your guesswork. If you're on an, a C chord, and they go to a major chord, another major chord, you know that from your theory that it's going to be, you have a 50-50 chance of getting the, guessing the next chord, which is either going to be F or G in this case. So if you're on a C, and they go somewhere to a major chord, like I said, you got a 50-50 chance. If they go to a minor chord, it's a little bit trickier because you have three options there. But over time, you'll start to hear if it's going to the 6 minor, 2 minor, and so forth. All right, so I covered a ton in this lesson. Hopefully, I got everything. Um, there'll definitely be a follow-up tutorial to this because I'm sure a lot of you will still have some questions. Um, but review a lot of this. So there's a lot of good information here, and hopefully it'll kind of get you started to think about these things. And this is just the start. We're going to start talking about modes, which is really going to, it's going to get a little bit trickier, but once you start to get a grasp of the modes, it'll really help you with, um, the, with just about everything else. Because that, that theory is, can be challenging, but it's the basis of a lot of more advanced concepts, okay? So that'll be another one, and yeah, I think that's it. So thanks for watching, I really appreciate it, and hopefully you learned something and got something out of this and can apply it, and definitely comment if you have questions. I'll try to answer as much as I can. So there you go. Thanks again. I'll see everybody in the next tutorial. Bye.